So welcome back and I do hope as ever you and your family are keeping well. So we're here, we're on the home straight. This is the last film on electric fields. And what we're gonna look at today is electrical potential. Uh, I'm gonna do a couple of calculations and then I'm gonna end by looking at equipotentials because that's a really interesting bit of um, this physics. Not on the syllabus quite so often, but I think it'll bring all of our ideas together. So electrical potential, so be careful, we're talking about potential, not potential energy. So this is measured in joules per coulomb. Uh, again, you might see the similarity with gravitational fields, uh, the number of joules per kilogram. Okay, but I hope you're familiar though with uh, joules per coulomb. As soon as we write that down, think voltage. Okay, number of joules per coulomb is a voltage. So, what do we mean by this? In other words, what is the electrical potential energy at a particular point? What is V, yeah, at point P? Draw that as a big P, okay? So, we've got a charged object and we pick a place in space somewhere near that charged object. And what do we mean by the V, the electrical potential at that point? Well, I think you're getting pretty familiar with this now. It's the work done, yeah, per unit charge. And because we're in SI units, it's per coulomb, yeah bringing a positive charge from infinity to that point, so to a point P. So um, you might think, well, what does this all mean? And what are the numbers involved? Uh, think about it. I, I should really draw a diagram, shouldn't I? You've got a charge here, okay? What's the potential at this point here? Yep. It's the work you will have to do to bring a charge, a coulomb of charge, to that point. Okay? Now, obviously, you won't bring a coulomb of charge. You'll bring a very small amount of charge to a specific point. Yep. But then to work out the potential or the voltage at that specific point... Okay, you'll work out the number of joules that you would have had to have transferred to bring a coulomb of charge to that point. So, um, what happens if we just say that the charge is Q? So, I'm going to say if the charge is Q, then uh, we know that the energy that we need to put into the system. We know the energy that we did in the previous video is one over four pi epsilon naught, that constant. Uh, one of the charges, the other charge, divided by that separation, okay? And we also know that voltage is joules, be careful with what that E is, yeah, energy, divided by charge, joules per coulomb. So, if we take E and divide by Q, we've now got E over Q. Oh, look, the joules per coulomb will be equal to one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R, okay? Now, let's very quickly um, whiz through this. What's that Q? That's the charge that was always sitting there, okay? This Q is the charge we're bringing in towards it to get it to a specific place and then saying, okay, how much energy would we need to get there from infinity, okay, to distance R if we moved a whole coulomb there? In other words, what is the number of joules needed per coulomb 
to get from infinity to separation R from our charge that's over here. Okay, and this will be measured in volts and it will be the electrical potential. So V is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R. So I'll put one of those around there. And I'll just remind you that this here is the electrical potential. So let me show you this a little bit more diagrammatically. Uh, we're not going to do any maths on this. I'm just going to sort of show you how this works. So a quick example. So imagine we've got our big Q, that Q over here. There it is. OK, uh, we make it positive. I've drawn it in red, but it's a positive charge. Um, and we're going to get our other charge and move it from here to here. So we've got two places. Yeah, uh, we've got, um, I'll choose this position here as position A and this position here as position B. Okay, and we've got some separations, so I need to come from the middle of this one, I hope I'm on the middle, to A, to B. So if you remember from the previous videos, this distance here will be R at A. And this separation, which might be twice as big, but be careful how these things scale. So this is R at B. OK. Now, if you think about it, if we take our test charge and we move from here to here, yeah, OK, we're going to have to feed in energy. OK, we're going to have to feed in electrical potential energy. So you can think of the potential at this point as being lower than that point. Um, I keep saying this over and over again, probably because I found it difficult when I was at school. Position B at separation R sub B, OK, is we could say there's a potential there and that when I draw equipotentials, equipotentials, this will become really obvious. OK, at that point, we will need a certain number of joules to get a coulomb of charge to that point from infinity. Here, we will need more joules per coulomb to get to here. Oh, joules per coulomb voltage. So there's a voltage here and there's a voltage there. OK, so we can say that the voltage at A, which I hope you agree is bigger, minus the voltage at B, is, well, it's the difference between the two. It is the potential difference, OK? The sort of joules per coulomb difference. So, for example, and this is often how I teach potential difference, yeah, it could be, um, this is, let's say, um, a thousand volts, okay, at this position here, and this is 2,500 volts, so the potential difference will be 1,500 volts, or 1.5 kilovolts. I'm just sort of throwing numbers at this, okay? Now, you might say, well, hang on. Don't you just get a voltmeter? Uh, the textbook that we use is quite interesting. It says it's, it's, it's impossible to put a voltmeter probe there and a voltmeter probe there. If you could, theoretically, of course, you would measure the potential difference between those two points. You would measure a voltage. Um, it's actually something that doesn't really work very well. There are ways of doing it. 
Okay, there are ways of actually getting probes and measuring the potentials at those two different places. But as far as we're concerned, uh, this is an exercise in mathematics and how we would calculate the potential difference. So let's have a bit of fun with this and see if we can do a quick calculation. So I've set up an example here. Uh, how much charge is stored on a charged metal sphere? Okay, but when you charge up a metal sphere, um, I'll just draw it for you to indicate what we've got so it makes sense. Uh, you're going to need to isolate it. So you, obviously the charge needs to stay on the metal sphere. So here we go. Have it on an insulated stand off the desk. Um, these things um, are lying around in cupboards all over the place in schools um, because they were used for electrostatics uh, an awful lot. So there's our sphere. Okay, our isolated sphere. It's not very spherical, but I'll have to do. Okay, and the charge will spread out on the outside of the metal sphere evenly. I hope you're aware why you'll get an even spread of charge around the sphere. Now, how did we get that charge there? Well, what we did is we touch it onto a power supply, put a voltage on it, okay? So you get an EHT power supply, yeah, an extra high tension, high voltage power supply, get the negative terminal, which is bristling with electrons that want to come off, if you see what I mean, touch it onto the sphere, and you get to the point where uh, the uh, voltage on the metal wire and on the sphere become the same, so charge stops moving. This has capacitance, by the way. It's stored charge. And let's put on it, or connect it to, minus five kilovolts. Okay. And uh, this sphere will have a size, it'll have a radius uh, and a diameter. So let me draw that on. Let's see if I can get it to look about right. There we go. So, diameter, some of you will notice I'm doing all sorts of things with the numbers to try and catch us out. Uh, let's make that 50 centimetres. Okay, so we've got everything uh, we need now, and um, how would we work out the charge stored on it? Well, if you think about it, this ring here, it's obviously a sphere, but this ring, yeah, is all at a potential that we know. We know the number of joules per coulomb on this surface. And we know that this surface is separated from the center of this by 25 centimeters. So we're gonna use the formula V equals, here it is again, one over four pi epsilon naught. You say it so many times as a teacher, you can't forget that. Q over R. So looking at that formula, what do we know? We know the voltage on the surface, one over four pi epsilon naught, we know, we know the separation from the center, how far out we are on that ring as it were. So all we need to do is calculate Q. So now let's put some numbers in. So the voltage that we know is equal to Q over, right, I hope I've drawn that line long enough, probably not, four pi epsilon naught, four pi epsilon naught, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Okay, I knew I hadn't drawn it long enough. Times by R. Well, be careful, 50 centimeters, R is 25 centimetres, must be in metres, 0 0.25 metres. Okay, um, I've, made, I've tried to make, uh, smudge here, tried to make my points very clear, because um, on an exam paper they can get a little bit lost. Okay, um, the voltage, well, we know the voltage here is, oh, it's negative, minus 5,000 volts. Okay, so if we solve this for Q, yeah, Q 
will be equal to, well, because this is a negative voltage, oh, yep, a negative charge has to be on the object, minus 1.39 times 10 to the minus 7 coulombs, and therefore Q is equal to, I, I'm sort of thinking about it in nano coulombs, minus 139 nano coulombs. So there we go. Uh, just for interest sake, um, we've done parallel plate capacitors. Uh, this has capacitance. It's like kind of a single plate, I suppose you could consider it, um, though it's a little bit more complex than that. But we've got a charge stored with a voltage, Q equals CV. You could work out the capacitance of that metal sphere. So I mentioned working out the capacitance of an isolated uh, metal sphere that's a long way away from all sorts of other charges. So let's do that quickly, but let's do it mathematically, not with uh, uh, specific numbers as it were. So we know that Q, the charge stored, is equal to CV. Remember what the, the definition of capacitance was, yeah, the, uh, the charge stored per unit potential difference. Okay, so there we go, C is Q over V. But we have a formula for V, we've just used it. V is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R. So, um, this looks a bit upside down, um, so that V is sort of here, but that's 1 over V. But if the capacitance is Q over V, okay, then this Q will come down here and the Qs will drop out, will cancel. So C will be equal to, now obviously because we've got to have uh, over V, we've got to flip this. So 4 pi epsilon naught, okay. And then it would have been R over Q, multiplied by Q, so R over Q multiplied by Q. The Qs go, and there we go, R. Now I'm going to call the radius of the sphere uh, capital R because that's kind of the way it's normally done. So we very quickly derive there the capacitance for an isolated metal sphere of radius capital R. So let's do a quick example, and I think you'll enjoy this one. And again, uh, if other physicists were watching my video, which I'm sure they're not, because they know this stuff, uh, they'd be screaming at my screen saying, come on, do this. I'll explain what it is, it's quite fun. So, I talked about isolated spheres. I did mention that in laboratories they're normally uh, metal, but hang on, what's the most famous isolated sphere that we deal with on a daily basis. It's the Earth. And the Earth, you know when you um, discharge something, you Earth it, you send those electrons off onto the Earth's surface. The Earth is a fantastic, well is it fantastic, we'll see in a minute, capacitor. So why don't we work out the capacitance of the Earth? Um, Oh, there'll be someone saying that's wrong, won't they? They'll say it's not the Earth, it's Earth. Okay, capacitance of Earth, whatever. Okay, uh, because it's not the Jupiter and it's not the Mars, it's just Mars and Jupiter. Well, whatever. Okay, so let's draw the, um, the Earth. There it is. Okay, bit of an axis there. Bit of an equator there. I don't know why I've drawn that, but just to make the point. And uh, we need to use this formula, uh, 4 pi epsilon naught r, okay, so we need r, so we need the radius of the earth, so I'll draw that on between there and there, the radius of the earth, okay, um, just for interest's sake, 
Um, you might get used to this notation later on that uh, instead of writing uh, sub E or sub earth, uh, most people just put a little, um, it's a kind of an ancient symbol, I think. Uh, they put a little circle with a plus sign in it. That is one of the ways of just uh, reducing the word earth to a symbol. Okay, so uh, what are we going to do to work out its capacitance? Well, we're going to wheel out C equals 4 pi epsilon naught R, the radius of the earth. Okay, we're going to put some numbers in. So the capacitance is going to be 4 pi times by epsilon naught 8.85. Remember, I'm very careful about showing the point there. Times 10 to the minus 12 times by, now the radius of the Earth, okay, uh, it varies because it's not a perfect sphere. It's not flat, is it? Okay. There we go. It's about that many kilometres, so 6,400 kilometres or something like that. Okay, but we're in metres times 10 to the three. Uh, I, I always go off on one, don't I? But it's quite interesting because if you use the radius of the Earth to work out its circumference all the way around, uh, once you start, or if you are driving already, you'll be amazed, uh, unless you buy a new car every year, um, how many times around the Earth, theoretically, your car has gone. I mean, I've got uh, an old Land Rover where it's kind of the, the uh, mileometer's gone round once and it's back to naught, 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 naught. Okay, but... Um, even just to drive, I mean, how would you drive a radius of the Earth? But you know what I mean. It's, um, it's only 6,371-ish kilometres. Okay. So um, that, anyway, um, that's not what we're doing now. So what's the capacitance of the Earth? So we bash that lot out. The capacitance of the Earth. I think you'd be surprised. It's seven. Um, I'm not going to do sig figs and decimal places here and all of that business. Just, just approximately seven times ten to the minus four. This is this huge earth, yeah? Seven times 10 to the minus four farads, okay? Which, uh, let's write that in another way, the capacitance of the earth is equal to approximately 700 micro farads, okay? So it's not very large, but we can calculate it. Um, Use it. I mean, you know, it's it's not exactly right, but you get the idea. Um, now, the Earth isn't a parallel plate capacitor, but these, if you remember uh, from our capacitance videos, are parallel plate capacitors. And at 25 volts, this is a thousand microfarads. So uh, this little feather, fella per volt will store more charge than the whole of the surface of the Earth would. Right, we're on the home straight. Uh, I'm just going to end this uh, last video with doing a little bit of work on equi potentials. Now, this is right on the verges of the specification, and you could say they aren't going to ask questions about it, but you really, really can't understand electric fields or gravitational fields for that matter without an appreciation of uh, um, equi potentials. And I think you'll find this interesting. So, what we're going to look at uh, is our old friend, the parallel plate capacitor parallel plate capacitor. Okay, so I'm going to draw one of these again, um, and you're pretty familiar with this now. So there's one plate, and here's the second one, and we're going to charge it up by connecting it to a potential difference. Okay, and you might remember uh, from earlier work, it doesn't matter what voltage you put on each plate, okay, 1,000, 2,000 or whatever, it's the potential difference that causes the electric field to form. So let's make this one negative. And that charge has been dragged off by the power supply, these plates or this plate here. Okay, and to make the uh, understanding easy, I know this is negative, but um, let's just imagine it's at zero potential. Okay. Um, remember, it's the potential difference that matters, so you can make that a thousand. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but let's make this uh, 1,400 or 400 higher. So let's make this 400 
volts, quite a low voltage, but it will do. Okay. And uh, you know that an electric field will form in uh, the gap. So we'll draw the electric field. Being careful to draw the direction. And the separation as being constant because it's a uniform field. So there we go. Uh, forget the fringing field on the outside, that's more complex. Okay. Now, equipotentials. So, what are equipotentials? Well, equipotentials are places of equal potential, okay, joules per coulomb. So this is at zero joules per coulomb. This whole line here, this whole plate is at 400 joules per coulomb. So I think you get the idea that there are places all the way along this system vertically which are at zero, 100, 200, 300, and finally a potential of 400 volts. And each one of those places I've chosen to be uh, to go up in hundreds is a place of equal potential, equal voltage. And it's that I'm going to draw on the diagram next. So I'm going to draw on some equipotentials now. Now the easy one in this case is the midpoint. So um, inside the field, again forget the fringing field, uh, it's a bit tricky for me to do on my projector, but about there. Okay, anywhere along that line, should be right in the middle, I hope you agree, is at a potential of 200 volts. This point here, all the way along that line, is zero volts, and all the way along that one is 400 volts. So you can then see that there's another equipotential here and you'll begin to see how you can work out where they are and another equipotential here I haven't got any graph paper on my screen so I'm hoping I'm getting this about right okay everywhere along this line will be at 100 volts and everywhere along this line will be at 300 volts so, if you think about it, if you have to move a charge from here to here, you're moving through a lower potential difference because the potential here is higher than there. But if you move the charge from here to here, you have to, it's positive charge, you have to feed in just as much energy as from here to here, or here to here, or I can't reach, up here to there. They're all places of equal potential. Okay. Now, the other thing you'll notice about equipotentials is they're not necessarily evenly spaced. Okay. Uh, they're evenly spaced in this case because I've gone up in um, hundreds of a volt. And it's a parallel plate system with a uniform field. Okay. But the main thing you'll notice is that equipotentials always cross field lines at 90 degrees. So that's quite a nice little uh, diagram to show you some places of equal potential in a parallel plate system. So let's look at this just a little bit more mathematically. So what do we know about these systems? Well, we know the electric field strength, remember what this E is now, is the force per unit charge. And therefore we can rearrange that for the force on the charge, yeah, will be EQ. So that's one thing to, to sort of bear in mind, okay? Um, the next thing that we know is the work done. In moving a charge through a potential difference will be equal to the force we need to apply times by the change in distance how far we've moved that force, okay? So if you look at these two formulae, yeah, you can see that the work done, shall I call that W to avoid confusion here, okay? Um, it's so confusing with Q's and E's and everything else, will be the force, which is EQ, 
multiplied by the change in distance or the change in separation, the distance that you move. Do you remember that voltage is joules, work done per coulomb, okay? So the work done will be VQ. And now we've got everything that we need. So let's put these two together. VQ is equal to E Q delta R. You'll notice what happens to the Q's here. So the V, the potential difference, will be equal to E delta R. R. So what is E, the electric field strength? Well, I'll come up here. E will be given by the voltage divided by the change in distance. But just to point out that if you move from one place to another, okay, you will pass through a potential difference. So we can describe the electric field as being the change in voltage per change in distance. And do you remember electric fields were in volts per meter? But just before we finish on this little bit, Okay, you'll notice the electric field strength is um, described as the change in potential, okay, the potential difference with a change of separation. Okay, and if we were to plot that as a graph, change in y over change in x would be gradient. Okay, so the electric field strength, if you think about it, the electric field strength is actually equal to the potential gradient. Now, um, how do you visualize in this case? Okay, well, sort of think of uh, putting a positive charge here, and you can sort of imagine it rolling downhill. These are contour lines, and you notice the contour lines, the equipotentials are evenly spaced. Okay, so it's got to be a uniform field. So finally, let's look at the equipotentials between two point charges, and this will test my drawing skills. So what I've done uh, to make the understanding as good as I can is I've taken an isolated uh, point charge here with plus 90 volts on it, and another one here with minus 90 volts on it. So if you think about it, there's an electric field between these two. So the first thing I'm gonna do is draw the electric field. So straight across from those midpoints, there we go. So there's one field line. And then uh, the field's not uniform. If you remember, it comes out radially, but in this case, it's gonna come out, bend round and come in. And then this field line is gonna go out a bit further bend around and come in. And we'll draw the direction on those field lines. And we're gonna have exactly the same thing above here. Okay, now this is getting tricky, isn't it? Is it gonna look the same? Not too bad. And this one. Out here, there we go. Oh, I haven't done too badly there. Okay. Now, I probably haven't quite got the separation right. It should be getting weaker out here, uh, but you get the general idea, okay? So what I'm gonna do on this diagram now is I've gotta put on it places where the potential is exactly the same. I'm gonna put on it equipotentials. Now, I think you can probably guess where one of them is, where the zero volt equipotential is, but the trick is to remember that equipotentials always are at 90 degrees 
to field lines. Okay, I couldn't resist. Um, I've corrected that upper field line a little bit to make sure that these aren't evenly spaced. Okay, it spreads right out down here and above. So let's draw on some equipotentials. Well, I said to you uh, that the first one is probably fairly obvious to you. So right between the two, between plus 90 volts and minus 90 volts will be an equipotential here and that equipotential will be at zero volts. Okay, so what we've got to do now is we've got to draw on the diagram places where the potential is an equal value all the way along the line. Well, if you think about it, if we've got naught volts here, we'll have a place that's at 30, 60, and then the final equipotential is on the surface of that sphere. So let's see if I can draw those. And I'm probably going to make a mess of this, but I'll try my best. So here we go for the uh, 30 volt equipotential. Now, I'm not suggesting this is exactly in the right place, uh, but I'm trying my best. So there we go. Uh, you can be critical of me if it doesn't, like here, cross the field line at 90 degrees. So this should come down a little bit more steeply here. Okay. And then uh, label it. So that's our plus 30 volt equipotential. And then the uh, 60 volt equipotential. Cross at 90 degrees. I'm going to put more of an effort in now. There we go. There's the plus 60 volt equipotential. And I'll go around the other side and do the other two. So we've got naught to minus 90. So we've got to have an equipotential here. There it goes. Of minus um, 30. And then this one. Crossing at 90 degrees of minus 60 volts. So there's R minus 30 volt equipotential and there's R minus 60 volt equipotential and R minus 90 volt equipotential is actually on the surface of that sphere. So there we go, an equipotential diagram for two point charges with a non-uniform field. Okay, don't be too critical about my drawing. You know, it's not the easiest of things to draw this, but I think you get the general idea. So just remind yourself what an equipotential is. Yeah, it's a place where all the way along that line, the potential, yeah, the number of joules per coulomb is the same. And another way of thinking about it is, if you sit anywhere on that plus 30 volt equipotential, you will need the same amount of energy to get from here to that surface as from here to that surface as from up there to that surface. Okay. Uh, it's interesting to compare with gravitational fields. You might think of what equipotentials look like for the Earth. Yeah, you've got the uh, field lines coming into the Earth and the equipotentials crossing them at 90 degrees. So it'll be a series of rings or um, more correctly spheres around the Earth. OK, so um, have another quick look at that diagram and see if you can really get your head around the important bits and what equipotentials really are. Brilliant. Well, we've done it. That's it. That's electric fields finished. So um, I hope you now feel you've got a really good understanding of electric fields. Do by all means go back and look at a few of the videos. I link at the end of each one uh, to the next one. But by the end of this course, I hope you feel you've got it sorted, ready for A-level. So what I need to do now is pick another topic and do a series of lessons on that for you. Anyway, good luck and I look forward to seeing you again next time.